In business these days, it's the market you don't want to miss. I'm Nelson Davis, executive producer of Making It. The Hispanic market is now the fastest growing consumer group in the U.S. But as companies bring in ethnic favorites from abroad specifically for that group, the really sharp marketers are thinking of also selling those products to the mainstream consumer. And in today's show, our entrepreneurs have their eyes on two distinct Latin flavors. One, you have to read. The other is edible. Their mission, though, is to make sure everyone can get a taste. Making It, featuring inspiring personal stories of struggle, triumph, and success from America's small business communities. Welcome to Making It, I'm Emmett Miller. And I'm Lynette Romero. He was headed for a career in Major League Baseball. Instead, he ended up scoring a home run in the publishing industry. Jaime Gamboa worked for nationally known publications for 11 years before opening the cover to start his own magazine, Tu Ciudad. Its glossy pages are geared toward English-speaking Hispanics living in Los Angeles, where Latinos make up nearly 45% of the population. The magazine focuses on the Latin culture in the City of Angels and printing it in English is meant to give it crossover appeal. Tu Ciudad is in its infancy, but Jaime has every intention of making it the most respected and sought after Latino magazine in Los Angeles. I think that the magazine really celebrates the Latin culture. And for us, it's, it's more important to focus on what the lives and interests are of Latinos in the city of Los Angeles. Um, and as we start to think about creating Ciudad and having it exist in other cities around the country, say like New York or Miami, that's really what we want to do. We want to make the city the star and give the editorial a twist from a Latin perspective. The magazine is financed uh, in part by myself as well as Emmis Publishing. And Emmis, uh, Emmis Communications is, is the holding company of Emmis Publishing. Emmis Communications in town is the uh, owner of Power 106, KZLA, um, they also are Los Angeles Magazine, Texas Monthly, Atlanta, Indianapolis, Cincinnati Monthly magazines, respectively. Um, I, I think it was a really, really solid partnership between us at the beginning to conceive this type of a partnership because they are the number one uh, city regional magazine publisher in the country. And it was very important for me to find somebody that really understood the formula of how to successfully produce city regional magazines because that's what we were trying to do. And I think what we, were, what we give to them is the, the perspective and expertise on, on, on really who our market is. Jaime invested his own money in the magazine. It was more important to go after this magazine as an investment um, rather than, say, putting your money into real estate or putting your money into stock market or putting your money away for, for the future. I, I do. I look at it as, as the, it, I could have put that money into a home. I could have put that money into many different places, but I'd rather have uh, invested the money in what I think could, could be a good payoff in the future. Financially, I mean, it's, it's really a tough go because most magazines don't reach um, profitability until after about a five, maybe seven year period. Uh, we've, we've been doing a, a pretty decent job at trying to stay on track. I think um, uh, realistically with this magazine, what we've been able to accomplish is, is, is to just not spend. We've been very, very tight on our spending. Um, and then for me, uh, that's it, been a good experience because we, we, since you're a startup, you have to be very, you have to be very cost conscious of everything you do, but without having to, um, without having to compromise what the quality of the product is going to be. And in a magazine, the two things you don't want to compromise is in your sales department and your editorial. Um, so we've been able to really um, invest well into those two areas. A year later, there are still lessons to be learned. I think that after a one year's period, we've been able to learn uh, to be efficient. I think that how, how you run a magazine, who you choose to work with you, who can get things done in a timely manner. Um, you know, it can affect budget, it can affect the flow of the magazine, which can affect the distribution of the magazine, and on and on and on. Um, I've always enjoyed publishing because it's, it's a true orchestration of many different personalities and people, but I've always liked that, and I do, I do liken it to being like a conductor of an orchestra. Uh, many different types of, of people that are involved, no matter how small the sound or how great the instrument, you really 
put it together to put one good product together. Why do people read Tu Ciudad magazine? It's the entertainment, it's the music, it's the fashion, it's the food. And we stick to those four things. An in-culture magazine is something that focuses on the lives and interests of the culture rather than being a magazine that's in language. So People in Espanol is an in-language magazine that focus, that's, focuses on celebrity and lifestyle, sure, but it's in Spanish, it's in language. In culture means that we are away from whatever the language may be of that culture and we're more about what the interests are of them as people. And I think that that's what people are, that's what's missing in publishing today is that you don't have magazines that are coming out to the Hispanic market. You actually have a large audience out there that just wants to learn more about their culture and their lifestyle and that's what Ciudad is, is doing. And I think we're doing it from a regional perspective because Latinos are so different in each and every city around the country. It's hard to produce a national magazine with one voice when there's so many colloquialisms, so many terms, so many different ways of speaking Spanish because that's how diverse we are. So knowing that the second and third generation audience of Hispanics is the fastest growing and knowing that English speaking Hispanics are also the fastest, they're here but growing and will continue to grow fast through 2020, there isn't a magazine that has, is a reflection of them and their culture. So that's what we mean by in culture. We focus on their lives and interests. I think it's interesting what he says about it not being in language because whether or not you're Hispanic or not or Latino or not, you can read it and get enough of the culture sprinkled in that it's interesting. Yeah, it's know? fabulous. I didn't even know it was actually in English. Now yeah. I'll start reading it because I, I know that it is. I'll give you my old copies and oh, you can good, catch up. Good. Okay, you can catch it'll be, up. It'll be like Architectural Digest. I'll have <laughs> yes. a, a backlog as it were. Exactly. Jaime says he admires athletes like Muhammad Ali who, like entrepreneurs, have to overcome many obstacles to convert their strong desires into success. Well, whether it's an athlete or entrepreneur, they must have the right mindset. In our Secrets of Success, Stacey Kumagi shares her philosophy for business brain power. The entrepreneurial mind works on a completely different level in business than other minds do. Entrepreneurial thinking is about thinking outside the box, taking risks, doing something different than the normal business person. Um, it's not about cookie cutter business strategies. It's not about the cookie cutter business or marketing plan. It's about having the mindset to be open to new ideas that come into your business life every single day. Whether it be with from a colleague or from a mentor or from someone that you're doing business with, a vendor or a client, being open to those new ideas that can actually make your business better. Make it pop, make it exciting and motivating for the people who do business with you, more exciting for them as well. Um, it keeps, gives you motivation and strategies every single day to have that open-minded entrepreneurial thinking mindset. It's about taking risks and making sure that you're willing to try new things to keep jump-starting your business. And entrepreneurial thinking is about thinking differently. Stacey Kumagai is the president of Media Monsters Communications. She can be reached at MediaMonsters at Yahoo.com. And now you can watch streaming video of more Secrets of Success on our website at MakingItTV.com. And coming up next on Making It, the product they love as children turns out to be a lucrative treat for adults. We'll give you the cold and delicious facts when we come back. In the spirit of small business, Making It is being brought to you by Comerica Bank. We listen, we understand, we make it work. Southern California Edison, for over 100 years, life powered by Edison. And by Honda, the power of dreams. Welcome back to Making It. It may be just what we need on a hot summer day, ice cream. The entrepreneurs behind Palapa Azul say their frozen treats are more than just something to eat. They're an experience, as Ronnie Goldberg and Michelle El Ghazi put it, one taste is like taking a $2 vacation. <laughs> In fact, creating their product took them on a trip to Mexico. They visited several mom and pop shops, 
till they ultimately discovered the correct recipes. And now they've got a unique line of ice cream and frozen fruit bars with flavors like sweet corn, mango chili lime, flan, and Mexican chocolate. Their all-natural treats are authentically Mexican, something these entrepreneurs say is missing in the United States. While the Palapa Azul brand has made its way into specialty stores, the goal now is getting the crossover market to savor their flavor. Here's a taste. Good friends Ronnie Goldberg and Michelle Algazi, former executives of Fortune 100 companies, came together to create a unique product. Our brand name, Palapa Azul, means those palm umbrellas on Mexican beaches. And so what we want to convey as a brand is that feeling that you get when you are under an umbrella at the beach. And we looked at categories within the food, uh, segments within the food category that uh, could experience growth, uh, where there were no uh, premium, high quality ethnic Mexican foods. And we found ice cream and frozen novelties as a great category. We used to work around together at Diageo, so um, we used to uh, manage to do all the marketing and uh, business development for, uh, for uh, very nice brands such as Johnny Walker, uh, Duars, uh, Tancray, Muerte Chandon, for, uh, in, we used to work uh, in Mexico, and uh, that's where we met. We were always uh, remain friends. Experience in business and a strong friendship made the partnership a foregone conclusion. He's my friend, so uh, so uh, I believe that going into a business with a good friend, uh, it's always uh, very nice because uh, success uh, is much sweeter when you can share it with a, with a very good friend. Besides that, I work with him in uh, uh, high ethical values, uh, both professionally and personally. He's a very hard worker and uh, he's extremely intelligent. So uh, what, what else can you ask from a, from a business partner? They are both savvy businessmen who knew how important it is to enter the market with a clearly defined vision and brand. We're marketing to all consumers. We're marketing to the mainstream as well as to Hispanics. We believe that we have a product that is called a crossover product, one that caters to both groups. Uh, and that's extremely important. We know that Hispanics love high quality products. It had to be something that would cater the uh, American mainstream market and the Hispanic market. That was very important to create and to develop a brand, a product, a positioning, packaging that would be both appealing to both markets. We didn't have a name then. Uh, we had a we came we we came out of that exercise with a long list of names and that we then um, presented to consumers. After uh, you know just um, working for large companies and asking uh, or, or requesting a market research, a very extensive and expensive market research. Now we have to do we have to do the same market research with the same quality results and we have to do it ourselves. Once they developed the brand, they had to develop the product. We started selling 30, 40 different flavors of the bars and we got uh, very good responses and uh, amazing reactions from consumers uh, on, on price elasticity, packaging, uh, flavor assortments, we started with very strange flavors and uh, obviously at the end we got uh, very nice, what we believe is a very nice portfolio of, uh, of uh, flavors on the bars. They debuted eight flavors in their initial launch. We presented at the Fancy Food Show in, in January of 2004 in San Francisco and very quickly, you know, for us it was an amazing experience to be sitting there and very quickly being approached by one of, some of the buyers of the top, store, top specialty stores in the, in the nation saying, you know, we love your product, we'd like, to bring, we'd like to bring it in. And by the way, this is my distributor. It took almost two years and a rather large personal investment to get product on the shelves. Well, without considering uh, unpaid salaries, about uh, two or three years of unpaid salaries, <laughs> it was a total investment of about uh, $400,000. Business has been steadily growing. Uh, as we have expanded in, in the, we have been growing a lot. We have been improving our uh, our presence at retail locations and uh, and uh, the distribution that we have. So distribution it's a, it's a crucial part part for this business. It's a uh, the balancing act of uh, of uh, of uh, everything that happens with uh, with uh, with a business that in, that is growing rapidly. Which uh, in your initially you don't have enough uh, manufacturing and uh, then you have enough manufacturing but you don't have enough uh, consumers so now you have the consumers and you're really growing in sales uh, and, uh, and uh, now you need to make sure that you have enough resources to give the right uh, service to, uh, to, uh, to your customers and to consumers. Since we launched now more than 20, year, 20 months ago, 
uh, we have uh, expanded to probably close to in, in, the, in the high hundreds of points of sale nationwide in over 20 states, um, um, mostly in the west, in the Rockies, southwest and northeast. We still have some opportunities, uh, great opportunities everywhere, but uh, especially in the Midwest and the Southeast. Michelle and Ronnie are clear about their vision and they know exactly how they will move forward. I think a pretty unique offering and we have a very clear vision on how that offering is going to expand with time and so um, in spite of the challenges we think we have a good opportunity to grow the, the, the brand into a national brand that has distribution beyond specialty into mass and other channels. As a business philosophy, Ronnie and Michelle believe in the 80-20 rule. They say having an abundance of leads and contacts are literally worthless if you have no focus and vision. And if you're gearing your product or your service to the Latino consumer, you're going to want to listen to Rochelle Newman Carrasco. She's got tips on how to attract that fast-growing market. That's coming up next. Our first entrepreneur, Jaime Gamboa, shared his startup story of Tu Ciudad magazine. And you can reach him at www.ciudadmag.com. And business partners Ronnie Goldberg and Michelle El Ghazi gave us the scoop behind their frozen delights. You can log on to www.palapaazul.com for more information. And now let's go to Emmett, who's in our studio with a very special guest. Thanks, Lynette. She's got more than 25 years of advertising and marketing experience. Rochelle Newman Carrasco is the CEO of the firm Enlace Communications. She's noted for her hands-on style and her expertise in targeting specifically the Hispanic market. Rochelle, welcome to Making It. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for joining us. Thanks. So when you look at a product, how can you tell whether or not it really has a, a crossover appeal or whether or not it will if you give it the time and energy? You know, it sounds very fundamental, but... It at the heart, it has to be a quality product. It really has to be not a product that people are just trying to make profit off of, but a product that people are really going to care about. So, you know, we look at whether or not there's an audience for this product in both the Latino and the non-Latino community. And you don't want to be everything to everybody. You want to find what part of that audience is going to be most receptive to your particular product category. So, for example, in La Palapa Azul's category, everybody loves ice cream, but not everybody is adventurous and wants to experiment with different flavors and tastes. But there's an audience of non-Latinos that are extremely foodie in, in their consumerism. So do you necessarily anglicize the product in order to get it to cross over? I mean, what are the key issues when you have a product in a Latino community and you want it to cross over to English-speaking customers? That's a really great question because there's actually two routes to take. There's the route where you actually leverage the Latino identity of the product because you're trying to reach a non-Latino community that's looking for an experience, looking for something interesting but not threatening. And at the same time, there's an approach where you do want to take away some of the Latino cultural identity because you want to try to be a mass market product and become vanilla, if you will, mm -hmm. and, and reach out to the broadest non-Latino uh, community. But in, in my opinion, from my experience, the more specific you are, the better. So if you maximize that Latino cultural value and you speak to non-Latinos that are really appreciative of that and interesting and Every day, the non-Latino consumer becomes more interested in food tastes that are Latino, in um, hair care products, mm. in uh, music, in entertainment, Now, I'll tell you, I could see a product like some of the things we're talking about, like the ice cream that we're talking mm -hmm. about, because it's something that's similar to something that a broader audience already eats. Right. If you try to market, for instance, lingua to me, I'm going to go, oh, wait a minute, I don't know if that's <laughs> anything I want to try. Yeah, but if you, that's true. And, and actually, food is one of the things that's most, um, especially like those kind of really cultural ritual foods. It's the same in any culture, the Jewish community and the Latino community and the African-American community. The more, you know, steeped in culture it is, sometimes the more difficult it is to, to cross over. But if you package lengua as like King Taco has, for example, as, you know, tacos al carbon and they, it's an ingredient. Uh, they don't necessarily 
oh. emphasize the tongue. So you part. don't know you're eating it. You don't know you're eating it. So <laughs> once you're hooked, you're hooked, and then it's like, ah, uh, you know, like, this stuff is great. This stuff is great. Exactly. All of the Algarborn, please. <laughs> so what are some of the biggest mistakes that av uh, agencies make when they try to do the crossover thing? Uh, one of the biggest mistakes is is simply translating, thinking that you can start from a translation standpoint. You know, words were not meant to be ideas were not meant to be translated. You can translate a word. You can say, well, two for one, but an idea it really has to be worked against the consumer's understanding of that idea. Okay. So um, translating uh, is sometimes a, a pitfall. Another thing is really underestimating the market. A lot of people think this is the Hispanic market and that it's just one homogeneous concept. But there's Cubans, Puerto Ricans. Mexico is almost 25% the size of the United States. It's a big country. So even Mexico from Mexicans from Mexico City are very different than Mexicans from the rural areas, from a Catamaco, for example, which is a, you know. So what do you do? Put out two or three different versions and market one to the Cuban community, one to the Mexican community, one to uh, Bolivian community? You you certainly can do that, but there are budgetary restrictions that sometimes make that. A, a real um, effect, you know, challenge in terms of budget. So you try to find ideas that approach the commonalities. I call it in common advertising. Mm. There's in language, there's in culture, and I like to talk about in common. Finding the things that creates a, a thread that will unify all of the groups, and that can be done as well. Or, as you say, you can also speak to Cubans specifically, and if you have products that are particularly Guatemalan, you speak to them uh, in, a, in a more... Um, direct fashion. So real quick, a couple seconds less, mm -hmm. uh, left. How does Enlace Communications help these folks out? We try to make it easy for them because we know a lot of people are, are uh, not familiar with the market. So we start out with understanding the consumer. We do consumer insight research. We do, uh, you know, brand. We understand where the brand fits in the consumer's life. And from there, we do marketing plans, advertising plans. We come up with creative. And we always do something called a back translation. So even though if we're working in Spanish, we're also helping the client to understand how that might be coming across if I were to take it into the English language. And, uh, and then we look at their bottom line and make sure they sell. Rochelle Newman Carrasco, got to leave it right there, but okay, thank you terrific. very much for coming. Thank you, a Come pleasure. Come on back and join us. I would be delighted. Excellent. Okay. I'll tell you how to contact Rochelle when we come back. Stick around. Featuring stories from American small business. Making it is being brought to you by San Diego Gas and Electric. Serving you today, planning for tomorrow. And by the Boeing Company. And welcome back. Our studio guest, Rochelle Newman Carrasco, can be reached at Rochelle at Enlacecom, that's C O M M dot com. And did you know that you can post your picture and your business on the Making It website? Just log on to makingittv.com. And while you're there, you can also order a copy of today's show, Lynette. And we want to thank you for joining us at Making It. I think you want to speak some Spanish, right? Oh, absolutely. A little bit, poquito? I would love to, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm next Lynette, time I'll learn. I'm Lynette Romero. <laughs> I'm Emmett Miller. Uh, we're going to leave you with a look at the final thoughts uh, that we have on today's show. Something that is very important uh, when you're going through those uh, phases is, uh, is to be very clear in your mind about the vision, about what you want to accomplish uh, in the future, because if you don't have a clear vision of, uh, of what you can and will achieve and you are not convinced about that, then, uh, then it's very difficult to go through those processes because it's a very difficult process. It's very challenging. It's very tiring, and uh, it takes a lot of effort. Uh, it takes a lot from you to uh, to get to the next stage.